Hey everyone, welcome back to Brewbound Frontlines. I think we have some audio now. Our weekly live stream check-in with beer industry leaders and watchers on the opportunities and challenges they're facing during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Justin Kendall and I'm the editor of Brewbound and I'm joined as always on this socially distant social hour by Jess Infante. What's up, Jess? Hi, Justin. How are you? I'm as well as you can be. So <laughs> I'm still in my, uh, like, I have no decor here. I, it I, it I took look me like, like two years, so. I, I'm on two weeks, so hopefully uh, we get something up here in the next week. Today, though, uh, we've got a serious discussion going on. We're bringing together four individuals with the pulse on e-commerce sales for the beer category which have surged over the last two months as stay-at-home orders have encouraged and forced many of us to change our shopping behaviors, including the ways we buy alcoholic beverages. Here to discuss today are Rabobank analysts Bercard Neeson and Jim Watson, whose voices you might recognize from the Liquid Assets podcast. Thanks for joining us, guys. Thanks so much for having us, Justin. Yeah, we we uh very very happy to be here. We like Brewbound. Um, Liquid Assets is like Brewbound, but not not quite as good. I'm not sure if I uh, allowed to say that. I don't know. You had a Watson battle, so that that is definitely worth checking out. We've also got Liz Paquette, the director of consumer insights for Drizzly, the on-demand e-commerce alcohol delivery marketplace. Thanks for joining us, Liz. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. And we've got Randy Ornstein, the director of alcohol for GoPuff, which is essentially a, an on-demand convenience store through an app. Thanks for joining us, Randy. Of course. Great, great to have. Thank you so much, Justin. We appreciate you all taking time out of your schedules to join us. And before we start grilling these guys, just a reminder to our viewers out there that they can text us with questions at 617 617- 336-8560. That's 617-336-8560. And one final housekeeping note before we get started here, a plug for next Thursday's event. We'll be joined by Stone Brewing CEO Dominic Ingalls, as well as Revolution Brewing CFO Doug Velicky and Rogue Ells and Spirits President Dharma Tam to discuss the ways top 50 craft breweries are meeting the challenges of the current business climate. Okay, let's go. With many consumers stuck at home for the last two months, this has been a golden opportunity for e-commerce sales for alcoholic beverages. Liz, sales on Drizzly have been blazing. I believe they're up somewhere between 700 and 800% year over year. How do you view this moment? Is this the trial moment that we've all been waiting for? Yeah, it's certainly been an interesting couple of months. Uh, you know, we saw that initial mix shift from on-prem to off-prem and then in store to online. Uh, we at Drizzly first really started noticing a discernible impact uh, early March, around March 9th, where I believe we were up about 60% over our baseline or what we would have expected to see at that point in time. And as you alluded to, have kind of continued to accelerate since then. We've seen a little bit of a stabilization in the last few weeks in particular, but still well beyond where we would have expected to be right now. Our, our initial focus was just around ensuring the, the health and safety of our employees and customers and partners, but quickly shifted to operations and uh, making sure we could handle that demand and now really trying to figure out the best way to, like you said, meet this moment. We do really feel like this is, as you said, that golden opportunity you know, prior to um, the COVID-19 crisis really, really coming to a head, the, the biggest challenge that we were facing was category awareness. Something like 45% of consumers of legal drinking age within the United States actually believed that it was illegal to get alcohol delivered. So, you know, with this moment really bringing awareness to this category as consumers look to delivery services as a safer alternative, I think some of the, you know, word of mouth, um, revolution I'd say we've seen during this time, I think you're going to see a longer term shift and attention to this category in particular. Randy, uh, are you viewing this sort of in a similar way? Uh, what, what's the opportunity been like for GoPuff? It's similar to what Liz said. It's been game changing for our business. We've seen a major shift on not just alcohol, but everything that we sell on our platform with the essentials, food, OTC, you name it. Where um, 
now consumers could buy everything they want and get it in their house in 30 minutes or less for a very low fee. So our plan is to keep the demand that we've seen um, post this craziness. And uh, especially with alcohol, where many people didn't know you could buy beer online, it's, it's easy to use our services and get beer delivered to your house versus going to the store, picking up the cases you want and um, bring it back to your house. We, we make a, an easy process. We make a hard process much easier and hopefully we'll, can, we'll maintain those consumers post COVID. So Jim and Bricard, with all of this explosive growth, how sustainable really is this? Are we seeing a true change in consumer behavior that's gonna stick or do you think people will go back to their old ways once all of this is over? And so uh, I'll start out here. Um, you know, I think a certain amount of this is definitely going to stick around. Um, you know, one thing to to think about when we think, are what are consumers going to change? Is a lot of their core desires actually haven't changed at all, right? So if you were a a thirty pack of of Bud Light consumer, you just want something quick and easy, versus you were somebody who was constantly searching for the the latest Discovery Craft beer. I mean, these are all the things you're probably going to want, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, but What's going to happen? Well, first, what's going to happen is you may not have money to afford some of those options, right? So we have to take into account for now, you know, recession effects. Uh, but then habits are changing, right? So some of what you drank before may have might have just been what you were used to. You kind of grew up drinking that way. Um, as we go through this period and it sticks around longer and longer, uh, those habits really change. And what also goes with that is there's a, a structural side, right? So as you build up let's say the, the sort of equipment to drink differently. So maybe if you're drinking more at home, that means uh, you don't just have all the, the mixers and drinks you need, but you now have the shaker and the jigger and everything else. You're more used to that. Uh, we're seeing a lot of our coffee as well. We're seeing a lot of that there. People are buying uh, at home grinders all the time, right? And so as you build up that equipment, you're now more likely probably over the long term to, to drink in that occasion. You certainly cleared a fertile there. Um, and, and I think some of that certainly uh, applies in e-commerce as well as consumers have you know, trial, as you guys said, right? Awareness, have you logged on the first time is probably one of the biggest hurdles. Once you clear that, uh, you know, you've made a structural improvement towards the, the long-term growth of the category. Makes a lot of sense. I'll let yeah, Bernard, I, uh, I, I would just say the, the short answer is no, it's not sustainable, but that doesn't mean it's going to be a game changer, right? Uh, uh, right now, consumers are forced to stay at home and, uh, you know, they usually go to work. They usually drive their kids around. And when you start driving around and you're not scared to go into your local liquor store, maybe you don't order as much from Drizzly, but you're certainly going to order from Drizzly when you need something quick or you know you can't get to the store tomorrow. Um, so I think it's going to be uh, consumers are going to get over that hurdle, but they will learn how to use e-commerce services in a way that add value to their lives outside the context of COVID-19. So that's the way I would, the best way to think about e-commerce and which platforms are going to be most important are which ones add value and solve problems in the context that the consumer is currently experiencing. And this is a very unique context where it solves a lot of problems. I know you had posted uh, uh, some data on Twitter the other day that basically pointed to the fact that nearly all generations that have, you know, shopped online for the first time since this has all started, everybody except for boomers said they were more likely to continue. So yeah, and that might be marginal and, and yeah. consumers don't know what they, they, they're going to do until they do it often. Um, I wouldn't dismiss consumers, but but I would always prefer to see data that is uh, a result of an actual behavior than, than somebody saying what they want to do. But Makes right. total sense. Yeah. So Liz and Randy, are the new consumers who are coming onto your platforms, like do they keep coming back? And at what rate are they coming back? Are you guys seeing a lot of return for, uh, for new users? Sure, I can speak to that. So, so in terms of who the customers are, so Drizzly's core consumers really are within the millennials, Gen Xers um, generation. You know, we typically have operated in more urban markets, um, so that ends up reflecting your demographics, right? Uh, you know, over the past ten weeks in particular, we have certainly started to expand outside of those urban areas and into more suburban areas. So that does play a role in who is using the platform and therefore your demographics. 
Uh, we did initially see the average age on Drizzly go up by about five years in early weeks. Um, so that was pretty dramatic. It's started to come back down in terms of new buyers that coming are coming in. Um, so it's still pretty early in terms of determining a little bit more about who that cohort is, what their expectations are, and how that's different from you know our existing user base. But in terms of return, um, you know, so far so good. We did see in early weeks too that our repeat rate from a monthly perspective almost doubled. Um, so those that new cohort in particular was returning to Drizzly at a more frequent uh, basis than the existing user base and over time has to sustain thus far. So, you know, all signs are, are positive thus far, but definitely something that we are going to continue to monitor and work to really understand this cohort, cohort and how we can best serve them for the long term. Randy, what's GoPuff seeing? Yeah, GoPuff, we're seeing our young professionals are 30 plus and being our fastest growing segment of our consumer. We've historically um, gone after or had a, a younger audience than probably most retailers out there. But uh, we're aging up as we also enter in larger cities, as also as we start introducing new categories like baby, which has been a home run for us, and cooking and grocery to try and steal the stock up sh uh, trip from grocery. So certainly young professionals have um, exploded for us, and uh, we'll, we're seeing the trend. Our uh, basket size has grown as well since uh, pre-COVID. We're, uh, we're working on ways to make sure that we maintain that basket size post this craziness. Wow. Um, so we can take audience questions. We've gotten a few already. So if you uh, are watching at home and you want us to ask the panel something, uh, text it to 617-336-8560. Uh, Randy, we got an audience question for you. What were your peak hours for business pre-COVID and has that changed during COVID? Yes, our hours have changed, although we are open 24-7 for the majority of our 200 locations around the country. We over-index on our nighttime, so call it 8 p.m. to 3 to 4 a.m. We have um, shifted to more of the daytime, especially as people like ourselves are now working from home and are able to use GoPuff uh, more frequently than if they're stuck in their office. So certainly a shift. Uh, I think we've also, we've sort of helped do that shift by adding in other categories that do well during the day part, like your energy and coffee. We now sell bad coffee and more of your grocery items. So we, we've tried to make the shift, but we've certainly seen the last two months. That really seems to point to a lot of younger consumers. And I'm wondering how much hard seltzer are you pushing through GoPuff? Uh, too much. We, we Is are, it really are, too much? It's never too much, but uh, we significantly over-index on that segment, and it's our fastest-growing segment before COVID, and it's continued to be our fastest-growing segment during COVID. Is this all top two players, or are we seeing a lot of uh, other up-and-comers getting some share with you guys? Certainly the top two have uh, maintained, but we are trying to be on top of the trends. Every craft brewery has uh, come out with some type of seltzer, it seems like, or presented to us, as well as more of independent companies, and, and not just hard seltzers, but I would say ready to drink cocktails or wines too. So um, part of our strategy is to be on top of the trends. You see RTDs and seltzers as the trendy item. And so it's up to us also to make sure that we're carrying that full assortment for our consumers. So certainly the top two have shown success, but we're, we're trying to show some love for some of the others as well. Jim and Burkard, uh, Gen Z and millennials are viewed as more adept at online purchasing. How has the adoption rate changed, do you believe, for Gen X and boomers? And I'm, I'm going off a, a tweet because you're so prolific, Buki, uh, that you put out there recently. Oh yeah. Um, so I thank you. Um, you know, I, you should follow me and not Jim. I mean, you should follow Jim, but I'm definitely the better follower of the two of us. Uh, <laughs> one of us thinks it's a competition. <laughs> uh, no, but um, one of the interesting things is that for uh, a lot of things like online grocery, the actually growth rate of online grocery has been slowing down. That's because the low hanging fruit and geographic expansion means that you're now going after harder to get consumers. 
And that basically means that the people who are using your platform are the people who are hardest to attract in the first place, which also means that the probably the people who are hardest to keep long term. And so for grocery, uh, at least, I, I won't speak for, for Liz and Randy, though it does seem like older people are buying on their platforms. Uh, the, the fastest growing segment for, for Walmart, for example, was 50 plus. Um, that is also the uh, demographic group most likely to cut back on online purchasing. So uh, I don't know how, I think that consumers are not immutable. They will realize they actually like this service and it adds like, it's really nice. Um, so it really depends on performance. And I think the beverage alcohol vertical and Drizzly and uh, GoPuff have been much more equipped than grocery in general to serve customers effectively and not face problems like, uh, you know, disappearing delivery windows and out of stocks. And I think it's worth saying that the, the older consumers, the one who've had the most years of habits of built up of in-store shopping, right? And you build up your own expertise and, and you know, you've got your routine of which stores you go to for which products. It takes a while to get over that. But once you're three months into ordering online or six months into ordering online, uh, you know, most people will have figured out exactly how to get what they want in a new world. Yeah, it, we're at two months, so I wonder if that's uh, enough time to to break my mom and dad of their in-store shopping habits. So, Liz, are are you? Uh, what what are we seeing on Drizzly as far as older consumers and their habits? Yeah, so so like I mentioned, we did really in those early days uh, start to age up pretty quickly. So, average age on Drizzly was thirty nine. Um, so millennials and Gen X has continued to really be the, the sweet spot for us, but we are seeing with new buyers that that number has started to come back down to around, um, I believe it's 35 or 36. So I think, you know, we'll see that average age over the course of Drizzly's history. We've seen us age up about, uh, one year on average each year. So, you know, this cohort that we have been serving has continued to kind of be, be the number one for us. Um, but I think we're, we're going to continue to, to take a close look to see if that's going to remain the case moving forward. So, uh, Jim Bricard online shelf space is, is kind of endless, you know, like your screen will just scroll and scroll and new products will keep loading and, and that can be maybe a little intimidating. So how do you think smaller brands can get noticed and what are some of the missteps you're seeing? Cause I, I know you guys tweet about this sometimes. So what, what can people do to make sure their brands are, are found? Uh, upload content that looks pretty and write good copy. I want Liz to perhaps speak to that better than I could because, uh, you know, I posted a bunch of pictures of craft beer on my Twitter handle at beverage podcast. Uh, and, uh, there were a bunch of craft brewers. Um, some of them very well-known craft brewers, uh, next to a Miller light can. The craft brewers didn't have images. They had old images. Uh, and, it's the brewer's responsibility to upload or present or give that content in the way that the retailer needs it through the portal that they provide you or through the contact that you have. You can work with your distributor if you don't know what to do, but figure out how to do it. Maybe Liz and Randy, I mean, you guys are the people who have to deal with the worst of the worst. So I'd like to hear what you guys think on that. Yeah. Yeah. Retweet there. Uh, so, you know, some of the things that are true in brick and mortar are true in e-commerce too. Labels matter. Good storytelling matters. Your creative does. People want to buy things that um, speak to them and that they feel like will be something that they can talk about to their friends. Uh, so, you know, absolutely your, your advice around talking to your retailers, your distributors, that's spot on. Um, we do also have a portal for brewers um, to actually just update this information on Drizzly specifically. So they can go to brands.drizzly.com. And, you know, we've seen explosive growth in use of this tool over the last 10 weeks in particular. Um, and in e-com in particular, it's, you know, critical things like making sure you have accurate UPCs and categorization and all of that. So, um, you know, we're definitely here to, to help provide tools to make that hopefully easy for brewers to do that and take care of that so that they are showing up to consumers in the way that they want their brands to be represented. Great. Randy, what advice do you have for, for brewers? 
Yeah, we stress every time we talk to our suppliers or distributors to make sure they're looking on our app and that they don't see anything that's out of the ordinary. So um, hopefully they're looking at our app and buying their products on our app. And if they see a wrong image, they should let us know. Um, just this week, I've gotten three emails from suppliers saying, hey, you have the wrong image and, and they provided it. So for us, it's it's more of the one-on-one -on -one relationship discussion. Uh, send it, you can send it to me or or Paul Doherty, who's my uh, uh, who runs our category to make sure that we have our images. It's pretty simple for us. We don't have a portal just yet. Great. Most breweries, even the, the, you know, definitely the big ones have a wonderfully big playbook of how to go into classic retail and merchandise and make everything look good. Um, I, I worry that some companies think that they can just put a product on an e-commerce platform and it just magically goes and they don't realize they need equally a, a developed playbook and they need to be executing it on it like every month. And they, they should now realize that they, it's just not that easy. You do have to put in all the, the work on the back end to make it happen. Crazy to think that putting in the work would produce some results. <laughs> shocking, <laughs> shocking insights here. Yeah. Do the work. I, the, the way I see it is this is your one chance to show the consumer what brand we're selling and so you can't pick it up you can't find a display it's one image on the app and that's it and so if the image is wrong it could affect that purchase and affect the future purchases i, I would only add one more thing to that which is doing this right early is also very important that consumers uh often uh will buy past purchases and there is a long-term value of being the first brand in the basket and so if you wait to do this, it may have long-term consequences in terms of your uh, long-term market share on these platforms. So speaking of making sure that you're showing up with you know, the right product, the right image, one thing that I think is pretty unique to beer in terms of the alcohol world is, this, is the seasonal program. So you know, before Brewbound in my old life, I worked on a national craft brewer and worked on a lot of you know, seasonal promotional products and seasonal beers. For the most part, I'll use the same UPC. So when we're in transition time, how can consumers know that when they order such and such seasonal, they're getting the seasonal that they're expecting and they're not getting like the last seasonal or, or the calendar hasn't shifted and they're getting the next season. Is that something you guys are hearing from users ever? Yeah, uh, it's, I would say it's probably our biggest challenge since we don't typically, since they are the same UPC, uh, it's up to our staff and our warehouses to make sure that they're, uh, bringing out the, the old product first. And, and then the goal would be that we then change the image when we're down to like one unit. So it's, it's, it's more of us working closely with the supplier and our supply team on when we would make that switch. Uh, we haven't done a ton of seasonals because of that, because it's a lot of legwork, but we will do it for the, for the major bets. Mm, sounds Totally logical. Liz, I know you guys have seen a, an uptick in, in specialty beers, which include seasonal. So is this something that's that's been an issue? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an issue for everyone across the board, um, you know, continuing to figure out ways that we can provide automated solutions to help ease that pain. Um, but definitely do work closely with our with our retail partners to ensure that we're reflecting the most accurate inventory to prevent substitutions and the like. Um, but that is, you know, essentially how our, our business model works is that it's a reflection directly of our retail shelves. Um, so both making sure that on the brand side, the brewer side, that they've got the correct catalog information um, inputted into our portal, but then also working with our retail partners to make sure that their POS is accurately updated as well. Just a reminder, we're taking your questions at 617-336-8560. That's 617 617- 336-8560. We're going to try and get to as many of these as possible and even do a lightning round at the end if we need to. Um, Liz and Randy, wine has a larger share online than in-store. As more consumers take their in-store habits online, what expected mix shifts among beer, wine, and spirits can we expect to see going forward? And I'll start with Liz here. Sure. So in the early days, we actually did see um, a decent mix shift in the direction of wine away from spirits and beer. 
that level set in uh, fairly quickly back to uh, an average mix that we would expect across the three categories. Um, what I would say is that from a growth perspective above baseline, or again, what we would have expected to see at this point in time, uh, we actually have not seen the strongest performance in wine. Uh, we've seen stronger performance in spirits. Uh, we talked a little bit about cocktail culture earlier, um, and then in particular beer subcategories as well. Um, so that's not necessarily translated to, you know, strong shifts in overall share mix, uh, but could be a telling sign for um, things to come. Randy, uh, what, what are you seeing as far as mix shift goes? Yeah, so for us, we're a little bit more unique because we own our own liquor licenses per location. So we have some locations that have just a beer license, some that have just a beer and wine, and some that have a beer, wine, and spirit, again, depending on legality and state. So uh, we're, we're seeing all three um, growing in the trends that we want. Uh, beer is our, our largest, mainly because we have the most licenses for beer. But uh, we, we do see, I would say, spirits, where we have spirits are trending faster than, uh, I would say, everything but hard, hard and spike is what we call it, which is our hard seltzers. And, and just over the last few months, COVID, we've actually started to see more of a premiumization of our wine and spirits. So instead of buying your $10 bottle, they're, they're trading up. We've got a follow-up question from the audience as well. Aside from seltzer, what is the biggest segment or beer trend in GoPuff? So we're big on local and uh, we're, we have a full local craft strategy as well as a local assortment strategy beyond beer. And so uh, for any craft brewery out there that has GoPuff in your home market, we certainly want to talk to you. Well, we're here in Philly. We have partnerships with well over 14 craft breweries where um, it's, a, it's a huge piece of our business. And so I would say that's the biggest, um, besides seltzers, the local craft has been uh, something that we want to stand behind and bet and also carry um, SKUs that maybe only could find in their brew pub, uh, st sort of being one of those uh, places where you could get some of those unique things. We did a partnership with New Belgium and Denver where we're starting to carry some crawlers that you only could buy in their brew pub. And now you could find those um, just for one week at a time in, uh, in our Denver location. Liz, how big is craft beer for Drizzly? Craft is pretty massive for Drizzly. So craft is about double the size of macros. Um, and actually, interestingly, since since COVID um, happened, we've actually seen a, mar a spike in market share for independent companies, which has pulled ale above lager in terms of share. Um, lager has traditionally for, for years been number one in the beer category on Drizzly. So that's an interesting trend that's happening right now, as I believe more and more people are looking to support local companies in their area. And how much of that do you think is IPAs just being like the juggernaut of, of this category? IPAs are definitely driving a huge percentage of that, but ales also um, have been the, the most leading indicator in terms of the growth from an independent perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wonder if uh, the in-store shopping experience, you know, everybody's shifting more to big grocery, big box. Uh, this is probably the worst place for craft, especially independent like you know smaller craft uh everything is going to bigger sizes so this is really like you know if people want to get out of the store fast they don't want to shop there um and it's just like the pack sizes that are there right and there's also a massive amount of skew reduction so we've been hearing both from distributors and retailers they're trying to get rid of the long tail i kind of feel like the entire you know brick and mortar shopping experience is moving towards the biggest of craft and you know, macro beer and probably leaving a wonderful opportunity. Like if I were a consum consumer that, you know, was just going to be shopping at a giant grocery, I'd probably start to split my purchases between, you know, local online and then, you know, the, the bigger beer in store. That's such a great point. So um, Randy and Liz, one trend that we've seen over the past few months is obviously toward larger pack sizes, like Jim just said. Um, online shopping is different. You're not trying to race out of the store. You're not pretending like you're on supermarket sweeps. Um, are you guys seeing the same trend toward large pack sizes? Or do you think people are kind of taking their time and picking out what they want in, you know, six packs or singles or four packs or whatever? What are you guys seeing? 
So we, we definitely have seen the median um, orders of beer within an order increase, spike pretty dramatically. Our AOV is up, um, up to about $70 per order. Um, but what we've seen from a pack size perspective actually is a decrease in 12 pack and up and an increase in four and six packs. So we are seeing uh, different behavior than what is being reported in store. And I, and I could probably surmise similar to what you're saying there is that you have a little bit more uh, freedom and I think a sense of safety in this environment to you know, do what you would le- usually like to do in terms of browse and make sure you're finding stuff that feels um, unique and or fit for whatever the occasion is. Randy, what are you guys noticing? Yeah, we're noticing our, I call it our medium packs. So that would be like your 12 and 15 packs are growing faster than our small packs and our large packs over the last eight weeks. Part of that is due to the 12 pack variety hard seltzer, which is a juggernaut for us, but also um, it's, it's a key package for our consumers to buy variety. And as our consumers are um, young and young professionals, they're looking for variety. So uh, also I would say that when you, when you throw house parties or tailgates or barbecues, which a lot of our consumers use GoPuff for, they're usually buying in bulk to, to feed 20 people. And so they might be buying their 24 or 30 packs and other items. And obviously with limited parties right now, I would say the buying of like multiple 30 packs has slowed a little bit, but more variety has increased. So medium packs have been growing for us. We're getting a lot of great questions from the audience. Uh, Jim and Burkard, uh, someone wants to know what you guys think the post COVID new normal will look like for Bev Alk. What is the pessimistic and aggressive level of what percentage of grocery makes up e-commerce? And I'll let you start there, Burkard. I would like to say thank you, Ben Galvin, for sending that question. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm almost certain that somebody that I've emailed recently sent me that question because that's exactly how I'm framing the discussion. But, um, you know, as I have been trying to think about, you know, customer adoption and, and, and retention, I, I would be thinking along the lines of a, you know, 12 to 18 month advancement in the penetration of online. Um, you know, right now we're seeing 300, 400% growth um, for, for some grocery chains. Uh, I, I would, my instinct tells me that most of that's going to, to disappear, but we'll see a really meaningful step change. And it's also worth mentioning that companies have the ability to remarket to consumers that have tried on to, to use their platform in the past. And there are a lot of opportunities to uh, uh, grow more quickly in a, a post COVID world. So I think that as things open up and things normalize, people will go back, but, but I think we will see, um, you know, when things settle out uh, probably a, a, a meaningful uh, advancement in the penetration of, of online shopping. What do you, what are your thoughts, Jim? And, uh, Ricard didn't say it explicitly, but it's not just the step change in the, the overall rate, but the, the growth rate should increase from this point uh, as well compared to the, the you know, pre-COVID growth rates, which is just a factor of everybody has made all the connections, right? So this is uh, not consumers have gotten the login, but brands have connected with the platforms and people have connected on the back end to send you know, data where it needs to go, hopefully. And uh, so, you know, everything is kind of set up to be uh, a more efficient and better for the customer system. So, so we not only expect that, you know, higher uh, initial rate post COVID, but a higher growth rate from that. We're heading into the Memorial Day holiday weekend here. Uh, Randy and Liz, I'm wondering if you can give us a little taste of what you guys are seeing on your platforms thus far. Are we headed for a, a huge weekend uh, of e-commerce sales? Uh, I, I know the scan data has over the last few weeks has been massive. So I'm, I'm curious to get a view from you guys what, what we're looking at here. And I'll, I'll start with Randy. I mean, I think every week has been a massive week for us over the last eight weeks and it's, it's stabilized. And, and yes, compared to last year, it would be significant growth. Uh, we, we, we have programming promos coming this weekend to entice our consumers to purchase uh, 
with the goal of um, buying a lot. I mean, I think the wild card here is will people celebrate the way they normally do for Memorial Day or holidays? So if uh, they're not going, if they're not traveling, that actually helps go puff because uh, we're not, uh, while we are national, we're not, in, we don't, we're not in every single zone of the consumer's house. And so typically when you travel, you might be going to a beach house where GoPuff is not there. So now that our consumers might not be traveling as much, um, that's good news for us for, for, uh, for that aspect. But so far, the week is looking strong, and I would anticipate that it continues. What's the read you're getting, Liz? Similar. So, so yes, it's been pretty consistent uh, in terms of the, the growth above the baseline that we would expect, and we're trending up uh, when looking week over week. Uh, Memorial Day weekend is is a huge occasion for us uh, and has been uh, historically. And what we saw thus far during this time period, I mean, we had St. Patrick's Day, we had Cinco de Mayo, um, and all signs pointed to from the data that people were absolutely still celebrating um, even while they were at home. So, you know, we would anticipate that that would be no different for this weekend in particular. And to Randy's point, you know, those celebrations might look a little bit different for folks uh, this year as they maybe spend a little bit more time at home. Um, so we do anticipate that to play into the sales data this weekend. So not to keep going back to Ricard's Twitter account, but Buki, one of the things that you mentioned a lot is how hard it is to get a delivery time uh, for online grocery. Obviously doesn't really apply to Drizzly or GoPop here, but it is definitely an angle that people are using and adapting and, and it's new to everybody. But how much, like how, how much in sales do you think is left on the table by people simply not being able to place an order? Is this a problem and how can it be fixed? Um, I wish somebody would tell me that number. I don't know. Uh, I've spoken to, to industry people who are literally going to supermarket websites or Instacart, typing in a different zip code in market after market to see if there are like delivery slots available to figure out how much demand is being left on the table. Um, what I would say is that um, most of the problems have been like not fixed completely, but they're getting a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a hint, I think the delivery slots are released at the top of the hour. So if you personally can't get one, try that. Uh, but uh, I got a delivery from Amazon Prime now at midnight. So, uh, you know, uh, supermarkets are opening uh dark stores, basically shutting down operations or closing sooner to be able to fulfill orders. They're doing uh, longer delivery times. Um, but what's really interesting is that, uh, you know, for beverage alcohol specifically, they don't have that logistical complexity, right? For like Drizzly, for example, uh, God bless them. Thank you, Liz, for your hard work. Uh, consumers just are buying from a local liquor store and it's a person who picks that off the shelf and delivers it a couple blocks away or a little bit farther. For a grocery store, um, not like uh, GoPuff, like you're literally picking from an actual environment uh, where there's other shoppers and you're observing social distancing and you often check out with like a, with a credit card at a real checkout counter. And so that's really inefficient. So companies like GoPuff and, and Drizzly have been able to do a much better job of fulfilling that demand. And that means beverage alcohol itself has been able to grow much, much, much more quickly than grocery. So um, well, things are getting better for, for the grocery segment, I think for beverage alcohol, uh, which has under-indexed historically, uh, this is a big moment and, and a, an opportunity to catch up to, if not completely, much closer to the rest of food and beverage. Jim, do you, do you wanna chime in or follow up on that? Well, I'll just say, um, you know, one, yes, it, it, to, that things are getting better makes a big difference towards how much we think, uh, you know, the opportunity over the long term lasts. Um, also, just say that shopping in store has a massive number of problems now as well, right? So, you know, my last trip to the grocery store was stressful and everybody has masks and is staying away from each other. Uh, it, it's none of the shopping is, is, is a great experience. So as, you know, the, the e-commerce platforms solve it perhaps faster because they can, you know, they can add on, you know, extra inventory workers, slot delivery slots in a way that a physical store can't just expand. And, and that is, you know, as, as 
all the companies get better at this, that makes a bigger difference uh, over the next few months. We are getting a ton of uh, audience questions. It's turning into an AMA here for these four. Uh, for, for GoPuff and Drizzly, with the influx of new users, have you seen people use your web app interfaces differently? Have you made or are you now talking about changes to how you arrange things, what you put on the homepage, product flow within the app, et cetera? And what is your split between website and app slash mobile orders? So we'll start with Liz. Sure, there's a lot there. Yes, thinking about all of those things. Um, so we over-index on the app side. Um, in terms of new behaviors that we've been exhibiting, or sorry, uh, uh, viewing from our customers, you know, I mentioned average order size has increased. So we had that initial stock up phase, but we have seen two um, Sundays in particular, people placing the biggest orders of the week. Um, so there is a little bit of that bulk purchasing happening. Uh, which is a little bit of a different experience than, you know, you ran out of your your cab for your dinner tonight. So thinking about how we best meet that moment. Um, people are moving up their orders earlier in the week, too. So it's different occasions that they're buying around. I'm going to cook up this elaborate meal tonight versus I'm hanging out with a bunch of people this weekend. Um, so there's shifts in messaging, too, and, um, you know, where how we're displaying our shelves throughout the site. And then absolutely like doing some pretty in-depth analysis around uh, who this new cohort is. You know, they are definitely highly engaged in ordering at a more frequent rate um, and have high expectations for the level of service that we're delivering. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely in a complete uh, process of shifting basically our roadmap for the rest of the, the year to not only meet uh, the, the changes in consumer demand and behavior, uh, but also to determine better ways to uh, support our partners, both on the retailer and producer sides of the business. Randy, how's GoPuff evaluating its app interface? Yeah, we're, we're evaluating it every day. We're big on uh, testing and using our robust data to make educated decisions. So Every morning at our 9 a.m. call, we're, we're looking at our app and seeing what we should change. We've added in a whole grocery tile at the top to go on the trends that we're seeing with baking and, and grocery stock up. In the middle of our page, we have a lot on the uh, COVID type items that you might buy with cleaning. And we also try and are putting in special moments. So movie night or um, like bundles and deals or cooking and baking. We just added in a summer skincare as well laundry, you name it. So we're constantly trying to be fresh for our consumers so they don't get bored of what they see. And um, the goal is a, it's, it's a constant. It'll never, we don't want it to be stale. So, and we also over index significantly on the app versus website. Liz and Brandy, what is the average delivery distance for your, your services? And someone wants to know what the challenges are for providing delivery to the suburbs. Sure, I could answer that first. So the, our model is we have a centrally located warehouse that we deliver in a three to five mile radius. Uh, so in Philly alone, we have like nine or so warehouses spread out around the city. And uh, we deliver in under 30 minutes. And so that's what we try and uh, make sure that we uh, provide to our consumers. If um, we see significant traffic in, a, in an area, we'll add another warehouse to make sure we maintain that demand. Uh, for suburban, uh, we, we, as, as, we roll, as we become successful in the urban markets, we'll slowly branch out. Uh, but it's, we got to be profitable as well and make sure that demand is there. But our, our model is 30 minute deliveries. And, and so uh, you'll see that maybe in the future we'll be everywhere and, and we're growing, but um, we want to we wanna be there right now where the bulk of our consumers are. How about Drizzly, Liz? Yeah, so so our average is not too dissimilar, about a five mile radius. Um, in a customer in one at one zip code can be seeing multiple different stores in one session. Uh, so we have this marketplace model where you do get price and time transparency across our retail partners. Um, and our retail partners are incentivized to be meeting those delivery time expectations, be providing great quality of service. Um, to be providing value through through pricing and deals. So um, there are options for, for our customers to be able to determine 
you know, what of these components are most valuable to them in that moment. Um, but similarly, like we do have a delivery time promise, which is under 60 minutes. And in terms of suburban areas, this is this is new ground for us. So um, I don't have a wealth of data to point to you in terms of how things are going there. But, you know, we set up and to deliberately target, um, you know, partnerships with retailers in area where we are seeing and experiencing demand. So there's an active effort by our team to, to make sure we're right sizing supply and demand. And that is part of this network growth into these suburban areas because we've been seeing demand. Great audience question for Randy uh, from Eric at Sierra Nevada. Do you see any increase in overall consumer basket size when craft is purchased? So are, are craft beer consumers bigger spenders? Yeah, I, yes. The answer is true for all alcohol. So our AOV is higher when alcohol is in the basket versus not alcohol. You could say the same for craft. You could say the same for wine. You could say the same for spirits. So um, that's why alcohol is an important uh, department for us. We want to make sure, we also strive to make sure that when consumers buy alcohol, they're also buying other items that we have. And you'll see a lot more bundles of cross merchandising with alcohol and other snacks, ice cream, et cetera, um, that will go live in the next few days. Glad you mentioned that. Can you tell us a little bit more about the bundling program and, and what can, um, how can brewers kind of tap into that resource that you guys are offering? It's more to make it as easy and seamless for our consumers as possible. So click one button and three or four items could be added to your cart versus searching or, or browsing for three or four mm -hmm. items. So our expert team has come up with curated bundles that we think our consumers would enjoy. And um, certainly if craft breweries have um, non op or food items that they think would be a nice pairing with their item, we could certainly um, bring that on our app. We're, we're all about testing and learning and, and we'll, uh, we'll bring on the bundles, you know, if bundles don't make sense. We could bring them down in a second. So it's not like they have to stay for X amount of weeks. Great. Liz, has Drizzly explored anything like that? Any kind of combination of products? Yeah. And, and we know cocktails are a huge thing right now. So we do have that capability via recipes on Drizzly. Um, but yeah, always exploring. We know occasions and seasonality are, are big decision drivers for folks. Um, and we do know that our customers typically shop across categories. So finding things that um, for that customer too, on a personal basis, what are the things that you're typically buying together? So it's both a mix of recipe driven uh, bundling as well as personalization to that individual and then more around story to our storytelling and occasions for the future. Great. Yeah, I know the, uh, the brewery in my town just started offering like Sale, I live in Salem, Mass, offering like boxes with all sorts of uh, goodies from, from local companies that you can pick up when you're picking up your beer. So just makes sense to tie everything together because we're all in this weird situation at the same time. So um, one more audience question for you guys. How are non-hard seltzer FMBs performing? Think hard cider, hard tea, hard lemonade. What are you guys seeing in those segments? I could answer first. Uh, I would say they are not performing at the same rate as our core hard seltzer, but they are still a valuable um, segment that we want to go after. But um, we, we, it's interesting because as GoPuff, while we're trying to go into a healthier assortment, we uh, on the alcohol side, we over index, I would say on the healthier, the less sugar and the, uh, which is a little bit opposite in our normal beverage where we have some sugary beverages that we over index in. So it's kind of a little switch on our beverage versus alcohol. The seltzers are the king for us. Uh, and then the, the sugar aspect is, is key. Too much sugar on the alcohol side is not paired too well. Interesting. Liz, I know seltzers are, are on fire on Drizzly. I'm on that dashboard that you guys have set up. So have you noticed anything with uh, other, other products? Similar story to, to the one that Randy expressed. Um, the other up and comer for sure is RTDs. Um, so that, that convenience factor for folks continues to be a big one. Um, but yes, hard seltzer absolutely is continuing to dominate. As far as uh, watchers go uh, of the e-commerce industry, Jim and Bucard, uh, one of our audience questions asks, if you guys could change one thing about the world of alcohol and e-commerce, what would it be? 
So it, as watchers who, who keep your eye on this, and if you had that magical power, what would you do as I lean in like I'm told not to? I, I, I want to answer this one so bad. Uh, I would rationalize, I would recruit the National Restaurant Association, Discus, uh, WSWA, and I would say, you guys go spend your political capital making state laws reasonable and safe. Uh, so, for example, uh, your Drizzly can be in 45, 50 states. These uh, delivery laws are very complicated and often don't make a lot of sense when looked at in aggregate. So uh, the state of Washington, for example, uh, requires that if you order groceries online, you have to buy $25 worth of food to do so. Uh, there are other states where you are not allowed to buy food and alcohol simultaneously. One of those states is probably not protecting public health better than the other. And uh, in a state like Colorado, the uh, employee has to, uh, employ the employee of a store has to make the delivery. So if you are, for example, a supermarket that uses Instacart to, to do deliveries, you literally can't offer the beverage alcohol category online, which means that consumers are buying their groceries online, but they are not able to buy their craft beer. And what does that mean? It means consumers buy less craft beer, believe it or not. So I would wave my magic wand and make state laws change in a way that protect consumers, but also facilitate uh, e-commerce in a way that uh, makes sense for everyone and everyone gets to play on the same, the same, the same terms. Sorry. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll wave my magic wand and fix all of the data backend systems such that everybody, every supplier system feeds right into every distributors, feeds right into every retailers without any issue. Um, and it kind of gets to the same point that Picard's talking about, right? Uh, there are so many different systems right now that it's very hard for any company to navigate, but it equally becomes hard then for consumers to navigate because they're, they're getting different products and, and different levels of quality everywhere. So the, the more you can, uh, kind of keep things uh, the same across platforms, across states, a much better experience we're all gonna have. Liz, I, I guess we'll extend this to you. Like if, if there was one thing on Drizzly's wish list, what would that be? Ah, uh, one thing. I mean, honestly, I think, you know, as an industry overall, we're still 10 to 15 years behind where we should be in 2020 from a tech perspective. And I think there are a lot of great partners in, in the space that are working to change that. And I think also given the climate right now, uh, more of a willingness to jump into that and solve that together. Uh, but it presents all sorts of challenges in terms of what we're able to surface to consumers from a selection and availability perspective. Um, and to Picard's point, that means people aren't able to always get the products that they want when they want them. Um, so I think, you know, it's got to be a concerted effort across all three tiers to build the experience that consumers demand in terms of being able to get what they want when they want it, where they want it. Randy, if you had one thing that you'd change, and I'm, I'm guessing there might be many, but if you could change one thing, what would that be? I think it's fairly similar to what the others had said but um, we can't sell alcohol in every one of our locations due to state legalities and we would like to sell alcohol where we where we have locations so pretty simple pretty simple so we've got about five minutes left if you want to sneak in a question before we're out of time you can text it to 617-336-8560 um Liz and Randy, and really everybody, um, what, how can new products to the market thrive? I know uh, one of like the traditionally long held beliefs is that when you're launching a new alcoholic beverage, you launch it first in the on-premise. Not possible right now, although hard seltzer has pretty much made a whole mockery of that notion. But Liz, what do you think a new product can do to, tr to thrive on Drizzly? So if I go back to our business model, again, we're bringing retailers shelves online. So step one is making sure that you've got a strong off-prem distribution strategy and strong relationships there so that you can get on the physical shelves in store in order to be able to show up online. So that's one. 
Um, so it's a little bit of an old school tactic there. Uh, two, you know, we've talked about making sure that your your catalog is up to date, that you've got great imagery and copy, and that you're able to purvey, uh, you know, what is so great about your brand to customers very quickly. Um, because like you said, the shelves are endless in the digital space. And, um, you know, we're working actively to provide a more guided and personalized experience to consumers. But doing that early on, uh, you know, makes all the difference in the world. And then I think three, like having a very specific strategy for e-commerce in particular, um, it's a different beast than, than on-prem um, and how things have operated in this industry in particular. So making sure that you've got that digital first strategy, that you're thinking about the different channels and media strategies and copy and creative that's going to be most effective there. There are different expectations in this space from consumers and, you know, competition is different. So thinking about ways to embrace, you know, social and uh, events from a virtual perspective and, you know, having more of a performance driven mindset from a marketing perspective, I think starting to shift your thinking that way is how brands will succeed. Randy, what do you guys see uh, in GoPuff for new stuff? For us, you know, we're, we're a retailer. And so uh, if you want to get on our platform, you meet with my team and we decide if we want to bring on your item. And so it's making sure that you know where to go. Uh, it's making sure that you're providing us products that, that we feel would sell well to our consumers. It's making sure that we're legal. You're able to properly push your fans to buy your items on our platform because that's a big deal for us as we're trying to grow awareness and we want to make sure that um, the consumers of those craft breweries know where they can find their product and and um, and get it in a 30 minute delivery. So, uh, and it's uh, you know I've, I've dealt with many brewers and wine and spirits and, and there's a wide range of experience between the people that are selling to us. Some bigger brewers have full e-commerce teams where they're providing us programs that fit our model. And then other small brewers, they're giving us the uh, off-premise key account manager that really doesn't know our model. And it's more of a discussion of who GoPuff is versus selling them items that would be a fit for us. I'm gonna think distributors, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was guess, Randy, you must always meet distributors who like, don't know you exist. Is that is that like uh, uh, you guys had James Harden do a sixty second pitch on on Instagram for for crying out loud? Is uh, is that getting better? I guess uh, out of curiosity, it's it's getting better. I mean, I think it's a little bit on the alcohol side. It's been behind the other items, but uh, certainly our phones have been running ringing off the hook in the last eight weeks of suppliers saying, hey, I've heard about GoPuff. How, what do I do here? How do I sell to you? So certainly the first 15 minutes of any conversation we have is, is us teaching them who we are and how they do business with us. One, we've only got a couple of minutes left. One of the things that I want to stress before we get out of here is this has been such a hard time for so many small brewers. And you all have offered some tips to them on how they can take advantage of these platforms and not get left behind. As far as that goes, are there any final thoughts that each of you have as far as what a small brewer can do to either get on your platform, get noticed, take advantage of this opportunity when maybe they're not able to sell through their four walls, maybe they're just trying to scrape by through a drive through you know, what, whatever that might be. Uh, we've already offered some great tips that people can go back and watch, but let's give them some final thoughts and I'll start with Liz. Sure. So, you know, I would say start now, <laughs> just start. Um, you know, Picard mentioned this earlier, but, you know, from a personalization perspective, that's the name of the game in, in e-com. So, if customers are having the opportunity to, to test out and try your products, the, that just increases the likelihood that they're going to see more of them moving forward in the future. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but definitely head to brands.drizzly.com. We have a portal to try to make this easy for folks to make sure that they've got proper use UPCs and imagery and all of that so that they're showing up in the right way. Um, and I, I would say have some fun in this space. You know, uh, consumers are looking for, for things to do right now. 
um, and for new things to try. I think there is uh, an uptick in the level of experimentation. So, you know, thinking about seasonality and, um, and recommendations and just trying to innovate from a product perspective too, so that you're showing up in more places and therefore, again, kind of increasing that likelihood that consumers are going to get recommendations for more of your products to try. Randy, give uh, the brewers out there some advice. For GoPuff, it's pretty easy. We're a two-person team. It's me and Paul Doherty. And if you don't know us, contact your distributors and we probably work with them. So contact us. We're happy to talk. We're happy to share more about GoPuff and how you could be successful on our app. We want to sell your product. We want to, we want to sell product that our consumers enjoy. And I'm looking forward to a big success in the future. So appreciate it. You guys heard it. You can reach out to Randy personally or get go through your wholesalers. Jim, one final word of advice that you give the brewers out there on how they can take advantage. Yeah, I mean, you, you need the playbook, but uh, as Randy kind of said, uh, push people who are on your website or coming to your bar to go to these sites. You, you couldn't do this with retail in the same way before. You can now just tell consumers where to go and where to get your product and then partner with these uh, these platforms. Buki, we're going to give you the last word here, which I know is dangerous. And I also, I love that you just did the hair flip, which I asked for. <laughs> I, I also want the big plug too for plug your stuff yeah. and, and then we'll get uh, rolling on closing out here. Yeah. So um, the one bit of advice I would say is a lot of e-commerce sales come from physical stores. Drizzly partners with physical stores. Guess what? You can identify which stores are on Drizzly. You can identify which stores are on Minibar. You can identify which retailers have the best online website. Figure out who those people are and make sure you're on their shelves. That's 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 not hard. Like you could do it. To log onto the platform, figure it out. Um, you know, uh, for me, I think we, Jim and I, have a podcast called Liquid Assets. It's a really good resource for people trying to learn about e-commerce strategy and, and, and running a beverage business. Uh, we had the, the head of e-commerce from Constellation Brands um, and, and a lot of other really intelligent people. So, uh, you know, subscribe to it and like it and stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a great show. And uh, it's uh, definitely for people who work in the beverage industry, not for your, you know, your cousin who doesn't. I subscribe. I listen. I love it. So tune in to them. We are done for today. Thank you to Jim, Buki, Liz, and Randy. We really appreciate your time today. We appreciate you guys fielding questions from the audience. Thanks to everyone who turned in or tuned in, turned out today. And Jess, wrap us up here. Yeah, so next Thursday, we are going to be joined by Stone Brewing CEO Dominic Engels, Revolution Brewing CFO Doug Bellicky, and Rogue Ales and Spirits President Dharma Tam. Going to be a really great conversation about the, what those three top 50 uh, craft brewers are doing and how they're navigating. So we will be back at 3 o'clock Eastern time next Thursday. See you guys then.